Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started, please. All right. So um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dar Roberts from the University of California, Santa Barbara, Department of Geography. Um, Dr. Roberts is an expert in imaging spectroscopy and remote sensing of vegetation, land use cover change, wildfires, wildfire mapping. Um, he also has expertise with LIDAR and he's of course been using satellites for a very long time. Um, I've been looking at Dr. Roberts' uh, research since I was a student, uh, and he has certainly influenced a lot of my thinking. In fact, he's influenced many of our thinkings. This past year, he was uh, named a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and he is one of 60 people acknowledged for their remarkable contributions to their research fields, exceptional knowledge, and visionary leadership. In particular, Dr. Roberts was cited for his contribution to spectral mixing models and driving pixel-based interpretations of remote sensing data. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Roberts is going to tell us about this research area in uh, urban areas. And thank you very much for coming. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. It's been quite a, a visit. Uh, very impressed by the center and, uh, and uh, kind of wish we had a center like that. Um, this is actually, uh, I apologize a little bit for the topic in that uh, the topic on urban, I could have talked about many, many different things, but I'm also giving a talk tomorrow at Bingham New University specifically on urban, so I thought I'd be a little bit lazy and give the same talk twice. But, but either way, I hope you think that this is a, an interesting subject. Uh, it's something I've been working on for about 13 years now, and uh, I think we've made a lot of progress. So we'll be ta I'll be talking about some of the work I've been doing with spectroscopic inf information, uh, vertical meaning basically LIDAR, and uh, lately I've gotten very interested in the thermal infrared as well. And um, I mentioned two specific people, uh, Mike Alonzo and Aaron Weatherly. You'll see Mike's work heavily um, uh, referenced, uh, and Mike's actually not too far from you. He's at an American university right now, so you should actually look him up. Look him up. I think he's a really worthy person to work with and a fantastic scientist. And Aaron, Aaron Weatherly is in the middle of a PhD, so she's got a, a little work ahead of her, but um, she's doing some really interesting work in the urban environment as well. And so I often like to motivate my work with, with information about why it's important, right? And so one of the first things one asks is why urban? For example, urban areas don't make up very much of the land. There are only a few percentage of points of the entire land surface, so one might argue that from an ecological point of view, we, we've shouldn't care so much about them. But I, I think, you know, for me, it's really, it's, it's where the people live. So if we want to motivate people about what's important, we shouldn't ignore the environments people live in, right? And in particular, it's the way urban environments are designed. So it's the, what they're made of, their composition, their arrangement. These, are, these have a huge impact on, um, on the environments we experience, right? And so, what we really want to start thinking about is how can we make urban environments that are more conducive to humans, right, to our better environments. And one thing that motivates me in particular is how these environments might respond to global climate change, right? You think about uh, 1995, for example, the Chicago heat wave, 739 people died. Uh, 2003, the European heat wave, 70,000 people had heat-related mortality events. And 2010, the great Russian heat wave, 11,000 people in Moscow alone. And then if you look at this little chart, I just pulled this off from the EPA while it's still functioning. And we have the lower emission scenario and a higher emission scenario. Um, and, you know, this is sort of what we're hoping to get. And if you notice the colors, you can see that basically the entire United States is slated to get warmer uh, and sort of the, by the end of the century significantly warmer. And just imagine what that means for an urban environment. Six degrees Fahrenheit, a lot of temperature change in an urban environment. In the more likely scenario, if we continue down our path, we're really talking more like 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are, these are not going to be pleasant places to live, but these are the places where people do live. Another reason, of course, is that although the urban environments don't make up of a lot of land area, they have a very large environmental footprint. You know, there are major sources of airborne and water pollutants. There are major sinks for materials and energy. And so we can ask questions like, how do the properties of urban environments modify the flow of airborne and water pollutants, waterborne pollutants? 
Uh, how does urban water use and, and essentially urban energy use? You know, so can we design cities that use less water? Can we design cities that are more energy efficient? Design cities that are better for humans, right? And so these again motivate us to study urban environments. And for that, I would say remote sensing is absolutely crucial, right? And that's because it's a technology that has a, a potential to tell us a lot about urban environments. Uh, one thing, they're growing very rapidly, right? So if we want to monitor the growth of urban environments globally, we need a technology that can give us a snapshot of these environments quickly. Uh, there are many of them are poorly mapped, right? We have great maps in the United States, or at least pretty good maps in the United States. Um, but many parts of the world we do not. And so if we want up-to-date maps, we're going to need some resource for that, and that's remote sensing. If we're, thinking about, um, if we're thinking about natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina, we need up-to-date maps. We need to know where people are, where the buildings are, where the roads are. And then finally, if we start moving into the modeling context, we need good geospatial data to create our models, right? And of course, remote sensing is our best resource for these kind of data sets. Now, they're also very challenging because urban environments are made of lots of different kinds of materials. And therefore, the remote sensing we use has to be able to cope with an incredible diversity. And to make matters worse, the objects we operate with, are the urban environment objects are, are small. So the footprint size of many of the sensors we use are just too coarse to easily operate in urban environments. But there's also some really interesting um, remote sensing technologies out there. For example, there's hyperspectral data that's many wavelengths. And there are a lot of new sensors that are very exciting. There's Apex if you're in Europe, Neon AOP if you're an ecologist in the US, or for example, Avarice Next Generation, which I'll mention, mention briefly at the end, which is really an amazing sensor. Um, on a hyperspatial, a lot of space-borne data sets that provide the spatial resolution we might need, like Worldview 3, QuickBird, RapidEye. If we're looking at the vertical dimension, there's LiDAR. And then finally, in the thermal infrared, there's a variety of sensors such as MASTER or ATLAS, and then a newer sensor, HITES, all give you good information in the thermal domain. And we can get a sort of sense of the challenging of, of an environment by looking at this figure here. So this is Santa Barbara, right? And so what I'm showing here is um, three, four data sets. Uh, three of them are real, one's a simulated data set. Um, the, Top one is uh, 3.9 meter resolution. This is an average next gen scene from the Santa Barbara area. And you can see the, the blow up over here. And uh, the numbers themselves correspond to the spectra down below. We're plotting reflectance against wavelength. And um, you, know, you can see th at 3.9 meters, we, we do a very good job of resolving urban features. So you can very clearly see the roads, very clearly see the different kind of roof types. You can see the, the red, um, brick, uh, the red um, tile roofs. And you can see the spectra that are evolved. So this is um, red tile roof, classic hematite absorption here. Here's a park. Here's a nice road shown here. And so it's really easy to see that at 3.9 meters. When you go to 7.5 meters, which is another data set acquired with a slightly different altitude, most of these features are still pretty evident. So 7.5 meters is not a bad resolution. If you go to 18 meters, however, this is the resolution of the History Airborne campaign, you start having an issue. There are some of these features that are no longer readily resolved. And then finally, if you go to the classic resolution of something like a Landsat at 30 meters, you get this kind of thing where you just really don't easily see individual buildings and roads. In fact, if you look at the spectra, some of these translate easily. The, dash, the dotted lines are the uh, 30 meter versions. So this is just brightness difference because it's a large object. This one works out because it's a large commercial building, right? That's resolvable at 30 meters. But this road looks like a plant, right? Because there is no road that's um, just simply 30 meters across unless you're like in the heart of Los Angeles where they do build roads that big. So then thinking about what kind of sensors we can throw at these things, you know, one of them is visible shortwave infrared imaging spectrometry. And imaging spectrometry can do a number of things for us. One, a lot of it's about material identification. So with these spectra, we can easily resolve, for example, what's a plant, possibly plant species, uh, look at impervious surfaces, possibly separate different kinds of impervious surface. It's really good for classification. We also find it's quite good for quality assessment. For example, if you look at the things that change the spectral properties of road, it's mostly um, road aging. So young, freshly paved roads look very different than old roads. Right? Uh, and then finally, of course, a classic thing we do with these kind of data is we do fractional cover mapping. And the classic model for an urban area is vegetation impervious surface, um, soil model or a vis model. 
Um, and so again, these are important. But we also have this challenge, which is this immense variability, right? If you're going to create a viz model, there is no such thing as one spectrum of a plant. There's hundreds of spectra of, spectra of plants. What is an impervious surface? Well, an impervious surface could be a, a um, could be a red tile roof. It could be, for example, an asphalt road surface. It could be concrete. It could be many things that are all spectrally distinct. So you need to account for that in whatever model you approach, what approach you use. Another reason we might want to use a, a, a mixing model of some form, form with these kind of data is the fact that fractions scale. And this is something I, I find very valuable. So for example, if we look at the same model, this is non-photosynthetic vegetation or cess vegetation, green vegetation, and soil is red, green, and blue. Well, we see if we go to 15 meter versions versus a 60 meter version, the results look pretty similar, right? So we can pretty easily scale from 15 to 30 meters with the exact same end members and get the same result. Um, the same thing goes, this is an impervious GB soil model, red, green, and blue, 15 to 60. And again, we see they scale really nicely. This one looks a little fuzzier because it's 60 meters. Um, we do see some differences. You'll notice there's lots more blue in here than here. And that's because when we compare the different scales, we see that NPV crosses scales quite nicely. The GV fraction crosses scales even better. But the impervious fraction does not cross so well, and neither does the soil. And that's because at the 60 meter resolution, it's harder to tell a soil from an impervious surface, right? Because it's more mixed. In the thermal domain, temperature is really what you're mostly interested in. So this is some work um, from Dale Quattrochi for this Atlas sensor showing the temperature distribution of uh, the city of Atlanta, ranging from very high temperatures to low. And so often when we're interested in the thermal domain, it's things like urban heat island effects. Um, other things that affect um, the temperature retrieve is emissivity of surfaces. And that can be useful information for discriminating different kinds of surfaces. And of course, a big part if you do um, urban heat island, you'll see lots of papers in urban climatology, which is clearly of an interest. But we also have a challenge here as well, and that's this ambiguity between temperature and emissivity. You can have two objects emit the same amount of energy. One object is hot, but a poor emitter. The other object is cooler, but a really good emitter. Hard to tell the two apart. And so you need to have a tool that allows you to do temperature emissivity separation to get a useful answer. And then in the vertical domain, we have LIDAR. Right? And so LIDAR can be really valuable. For example, one of the key areas that's very, very valuable is things like crown segmentation, creating objects out of, of collections of pixels. Um, clearly, another thing is vertical height metrics. So this is work from Mike Alonzo. Um, and here you're looking at um, various watershed um, segmentation created crown objects. And then each one of those A, B, and C, this is what the actual point cloud looks like. And so you can get things like the height of the tree, the base of the crown, the um, you know, median distribution of height returns, all from this LIDAR information, and that could be then useful for urban forestry applications. The challenge with LIDAR, of course, is just not enough of it. Um, there's very few urban areas that really have this kind of quality of data. And so I'll be talking about the city of Santa Barbara. Um, it's, of course, where I live, so it's nice, although technically I live in Goleta. And, uh, and one of the reasons we care about it, too, is that we have a lot of data, right? So if we look at, for example, the VSWIR, we have an immense population of hyperspectral data, lots of Avarice Classic at multiple scales from seven and a half meters up, um, an Avarice Next Gen with resolutions on the order of four meters or better. Um, so this is an uh, Avarice um, Classic image showing Isla Vista, Goleta, Highway 101, et cetera. Um, and then we also have lots of thermal data. And what's really nice about that is it's acquired exactly at the same time as the VSWIR data, right? So these were all deployed on the same airborne platform. Here we're working with master data from 15 to 36 meter resolution, cleared anywhere between 2008 to 2016, right? And then the final thing is through, because of a NSF rapid proposal and funding from the Naval Postgraduate School, we were able to get some really nice LIDAR data. And so we have this really nice collection of waveform LIDAR. This is 40 to 50 points per meter squared waveform LIDAR data. So it's, it's really pretty incredible data to work with. So we have all the data sets on our hands. And so what I'm going to do now is, is sort of tell you three stories. The first one is one that's published in Dale Quattrochi's newest book coming out um, on multi-scale analysis of urban areas using mixing models. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinds of work we do in mapping fractional cover in an urban area and some of the innovative techniques we're using. Um, this is work done with Mike Alonzo, uh, Aaron Weatherly, 
And then Ken Dudley. Kenneth Dudley is this amazing programmer. Um, so if you ever use Viper Tools 2, it's Kevin's, it's Ken's tool, right? And then Phil Dennison is um, at University of Utah, and he's Ken's uh, advisor, right? And so a lot of, um, so we were interested in mapping fractional cover and, and classifying an urban environment. And the tool we use is multiple end member spectral mixture analysis, or MESMA, right? And so, so what is that? Well, it's really just an extension of a simple linear mixing model, right? So with a linear model, what you do is you, you take a mixed pixel that is made up of multiple things, and you unmix it, you decompose that into measures of fractional cover, right? Um, and the end member, the materials that are pure that we use are, are called end members, right? Now, the challenge we have in an urban environment, if you remember, was that immense diversity, right? If you're going to unmix things as a plant, impervious, and soil, what do you use, right? Well, MESMA allows you to accommodate that because it allows the number and types of end members to vary on a per pixel basis. And basically, we also constrain it so the candidate models must fit the data, so they have to have a good um, fit, but they also have to meet fractional constraints, right? So that means they have to be physically reasonable fractions between zero and 100%. Um, when we, any one pixel can be modeled by more than one model. Um, you might have a pixel modeled by 15 different kinds. So what we do is we select the model that best fits the data, the one with the minimum RMS. And then what we can do is we can actually model different levels of complexity. Is it best modeled with two end members, three end members, or four? The way we decide is how much change we see and the in improvement we see in the fit. If the fit is really bad at, at one, two end members, but gets really better at three, we would choose the three end member case. But if it's really good at two and doesn't improve from three to four, why would we go more complex? So then one of the outputs we get from this then is a complexity map. And so we can see how many end members were chosen. Here it's three, two, and one in red, green, and blue. And one means one bright object in shade. And so you can see here that a lot of this landscape, it can be modeled by two or three, two or one thing plus shade, right? The other thing is when we run it in a two end member case, we're making a choice. The model's picking something, right? And so what it's doing is it's picking a spectrum, right? That's another way of saying I'm classifying the image. So the choice the modeling effort makes in what it picks is a classified product, right? And so another key area, and this is actually one of, the, one of the most common uses of MESMA, is classification, right? And then finally, the one on the right is really what we're looking for is fractional cover. And so this is a measure of, of how much non-photosynthetic vegetation, green vegetation, or soils were, were present in that pixel. So we kind of get it all. We get how complex is the scene, what's it's made out of, and what's its fractional cover all in one sweep. Now, the actual process of producing a, a good product is, can be complicated. And this is one of the areas I think there's a lot of research going on in improving or speeding the process up. Um, but the, what we did with this particular study is first we need a source of end members. And so we're deriving the end members primarily from the imagery. So this is from Avaris. And from that we build libraries. So we have polygons of things we know. We build the library. And then what we do is we randomly divide that population into a subset of training and validation data. right? Now, because some of the things we're interested in occur at resolutions far below the sensor resolution, such as a sidewalk, I have added in some field spectra. So I spent a lot of time crawling on roofs and things collecting about 600 field spectra. And so we have that as well. So we add that here. And then what we do is we run this program, this, um, program developed by um, Keeley Roth called IES, Iterative End Member Selections. What that does is it looks at this whole population of spectra. And it says, OK, grab the end member that, if you classified the image, gave it the highest accuracy. That's end member one. So that pulls in number one. Then it says, grab the next end member of the line that, in combination, produces the highest improvement accuracy as a kappa. That's two. And it continues to do this, grabbing new end members. But in addition, it goes back, recognizing that perhaps that first end member selection wasn't optimal, just it was by that pathway. It it removes end members along the line and checks to see if that impacts the accuracy. So it's progressively adding and subtracting end members to come up with this final library. We do that 10 times. So we do 10 random draws. And from that, we produce the final library that consists of the best performance, because each library may be very different. Then we put up this phase here. Now, we recognize that that library, as much as it's a good library, may not be representative of an image. Right? Because remember, these are samples from an image. 
And so we go in now, and now we assess how well does it do on an image. And this is really critical. And so we apply it to the image, and we say, well, you know, I yes, that this was a great library. But it turns out this selection of end members were not modeled anywhere in the image, right? Bad selection. Or, for example, it grabbed a, a, let's say, a soil spectrum that does a really good job of mapping the wrong kind of material. Another bad choice. So what we would do is go in and assess how the, in, the library performed on the image, remove the bad performers, rerun it again to see how it does. And you do this, and it takes about three iterations until you finally come up with this final product that produces a really nice classified map. And now we do the next box, which is fraction mapping, which is a different process than classification. In this case, we want to know what's the fractional cover. And the reason I say it's a different, let's say, for example, in your, one of your classes is an orchard, right? Well, an orchard may not be pure. An orchard could be a mixture of trees and, and soil, right? That's usually the way orchards work. That means the end member you picked to map orchards may be a terrible end member for fractional cover mapping, right? And so you want to remove those, so that makes the no-mix library. And then finally, you still end up with several hundred spectra, and you want to know, okay, do I really need 60 different kinds of green vegetation? Well, it turns out it's perhaps a subset of that, consisting of maybe 15, would produce exactly the same map because there's so much spectral degeneracy. So you need a technique that removes these degenerate spectra to come up with the smallest possible subset. And so the way I did it this way, which is the way these usually work, is DAR does really boneheaded stuff in Excel and other things, and somebody makes a better program from that, is I start out by grabbing the four most unique spectra, ran it, figured out what was unmodeled by those four, removed them from the library, picked the next four most unique thing left over, re-ran it, and continued to iterate to come down with a final population of significantly fewer end members that produced stable fractions. Right? And so what did we get? So this is what we get. So again, we get a fractional cover map. So this is your classic Viz model. Impervious is shown in here in red. Now vegetation, the, the Viz model doesn't make a distinction between live and dead vegetation. And so in this case, this is what you would get. NPV plus GV is the green side and then soil. So this would be your classic Viz model, and you can see the urban center nicely displayed. Alternatively, you could create a different model where you pull apart the different kinds of, of surfaces. So here now is my ecological model in B. That's NPVGV soil is red, green, and blue. And now you see that there isn't a lot of senesce plant material in the urban area, and that's kind of typical of most urban areas. We don't typically leave areas full of dead plants, right? That doesn't look good. And then now here, we can take that impervious thing and we can break it into its components. So red, green, and blue is paved, roof, and rock, right? And so you can see the paved um, areas clearly mapping the roads as paved. The, green, the roofs are green, and those clearly map the roofs quite well. And of course, the rock is, there's some rock there, but it's probably not so great. Um, and then finally, we also, as a part of this process, produced a classified map. And so here's the different kinds of things, ranging, for example, from avocados to black mustard on the plant side, the coast live oak, to different roof types, like red tile roof and commercial. So the cyan, for example, is commercial roofs, and the red tile is the red stuff in there, and it did a really nice job of mapping out the red tile roof. So, so I could take this environment and split apart the different components of impervious, as well as map out what kind of impervious material it was. Now, we also have the LIDAR. And so one of the things we thought about, you know, when you're writing a book chapter, there's a sort of liberation to it, that you can do things you would never do in a journal article. And I said, we got LIDAR. Let's compare the height classes from MESMA to the LIDAR height classes. And so Mike Alonzo brought in his expertise. And so this is the LIDAR version, where you have buildings, tall vegetation, short building, vegetation, ground. And this is the avarice derived version of it. And, and I was actually blown away. I said, wow, we were actually able to discriminate different height classes with the avarice, with spectroscopic data. And of course, that's because a tree looks different than grass, right? That's because a roof looked different enough from ground to actually map out a different vegetation, not a different class. So we took it a little farther and said, okay, well, how did we do really, right? And so Mike went out and found 13 sort of polygons of representative kinds of land use classes and, uh, and compared them, you know, anything from what uh, he called abundant red tile roofs to dense commercial to lower density commercial with some red tile. 
And when you compare the LIDAR to MESMA, so the LIDAR is, green, is gray, MESMA is green, what you see in general is it did pretty well, but there were some places, in general, it always underestimated the percentage of taller objects, right? And in some cases, for example, such as dense commercial and commercial uh, industrial, it did really badly, right? We could also look at the building in the same basic story. In most cases, MESMA was underestimating the proportion of building in these areas. But what it did, in, um, whereas on the other side, it way overestimated the ground, right? And this, this makes actually perfect sense because what was happening to a large extent is there are certain kinds of roof materials that are virtually identical to asphalt, right? Composite shingle roofs are asphalt for all intents and purposes. And so it was mapping out these as ground surfaces when actually it's a roof, and only the LIDAR data is going to tell you that it actually has a vertical height. So the error, and then on the vegetation side, shadows cast by a plant look like a plant, but it's actually asphalt, right? So it's calling that plant when it's actually an asphalt surface that's shadowed by a tree. And so it made sense, this kind of error. We also looked at the fractions. Um, and we did a, a fraction validation. Here we compared um, NAEP data um, processed using e-cognition versus, um, versus a, uh, our MESMO results. And we got pretty good results. We have a pretty high correlation, R squared for NPV and GV. Not so good for soil. Part of the problem is there's not a lot of soil in this environment. Um, we did actually pretty well with a nice linear relationship for roofs. But we can see this nonlinear non relationship for paved ground and impervious. And a lot of that, again, is this whole issue of confusion between roof and road and the confusion, in this case, between shadows cast by a tree, which looks like a plant, but actually is asphalt that looks like dark plant. Um, so when the fractional cover of a paved ground is low, we tend to not see it, right? And it only when you get a lot of paved ground do you begin to pick it up because there's no longer trees to shadow it, right? And I think one thing that's very interesting about is, is in cases like a roof where shadows are not cast by plants so much, we see it's a linear relationship. So it really is the shadowing of roads. And then finally, we, we're all interested in, okay, can we do anything useful with this stuff? Because I'm good at making products that are useless. Um, and so... So here's a product, and one of the things we were interested in is, okay, let's just look at what housing values through census tracts and see the relationship between fractional cover and pervious surface and, and uh, census value. And you see the relationship you might accept in, this, in an area like Santa Barbara. Houses are worth a lot, you have a lot of trees, right? Houses are not worth so much, you don't have a lot of trees, right? And it's a nice relationship. And of course, what is it? It's mostly impervious. So in this environment, there's a strong correlation between the value of your house and whether you have a tree or not, right? And of course, that translates to all kinds of amenities to having trees. So our next story is going to be in the thermal. And so having data in the vSWR and the thermal, I was very interested in can we do more with this, right? And in particular, I was interested in if we have really good information on fractional cover from the vSWR, can we do something with that to tell us more about subpixel temperatures that occur in, for example, canopies, and other surfaces, right? And this is work myself, Aaron Weatherly, Phil Dennison, Keely Roth, um, Glenn Holly from JPL, and Kenneth Dudley again. Um, and so what inspired this was this original work I did where one looked at the green veg land surface temperature relationship. And what we found is, as one might expect, it's an inverse relationship. The more your fractional cover of vegetation is, the cooler the surface. You know, we all know that, right? So, you know, you have high fractional cover, we have low temperatures. Um, what I was surprised by this is the clustering. The fact that if you define, if you classify these by vegetation type, species, or cover type, what you find is they all form unique clusters in space, right, in this, this GVLST space. So a eucalyptus with the same fractional cover is colder than an avocado, right? Or, for example, this is blue oak, and a blue oak is warmer than, for example, um, actually, I think this is, um, this is, yeah, this is our blue oak is warmer, for example, than Quercus agrifolia. They're both oaks, but the blue oak is much warmer. And so there was this species relationship. Um, I think one of the most interesting, these are both senesce plant material. This is from black mustard, and this is dead grass, right? Black mustard is a good 10 degrees Celsius colder than dead grass, but they're both dead, right? So, 
So I was really interested in the relationship, and I wanted to see, is there a way I could create a model that would allow me to use this information to do a sub-pixel temperature estimation? Because there's a lot of scatter in that relationship that it has to do with how the plants are functioning. And I came up with this. The idea was then, let's take advantage of the v-square data. And so the, what the v-square data is gives us fractional cover, right? And so I have fractional cover of two surfaces like here. Let's say this is an oak end member and a pure road end member. And so I could then assign a temperature to the pure oak. So this would be 303 Kelvin. I would also pull off a temperature of a pure road, 323. Based on the v-square fraction, we could come up with a modeled temperature, the temperature we would expect given the fractional cover. Right? I can then compare that to the actual measurement of the temperature and look at the residual between measurement and model. And we might find out, for example, that this measured mixed pixel is much warmer than we would expect given the fractional cover. There's a couple ways we can interpret that. One, we can say that the oak is hotter than you'd expect and perhaps is undergoing heat stress. Or, for example, perhaps the road had a lower albedo and was warmer than we actually anticipated given the model we were using. Right? So there's a different kinds of things we could approach. Now, one of the nice things is, and another reason I did this, is I had all the data in hand. Right? I'd already just written this chapter for Dale's paper, and I had all this stuff done. I said, well, what can I do with it? Right? Well, let's take the N these NPVGV soil model, our ro rock paved roof model over here. Let's take the classified product. Now, here we simplified it. I started off with 23 classes and found that not every one of those is thermally distinct. Some of these things were not statistically significantly different. Turned out an oak is not that significantly colder, well, warmer than, for example, a eucalyptus. Right? And so I had to collapse some of them into a smaller subset of thermal classes. And then finally, I had master land surface temperature data collected at the exact same time. Right? And it's nice there, too, is master is a multi-channel system that can give you good temperatures separate of emissivity. And so then I take that model and I, I populate it. Right? So I went in and found all the pixels that were 15 meter, were pure one class at 15 meter resolution and used that to build up a data set of temperature relationships for all the different major thermal classes. And then the model I'm going to generate is one that says the land surface temperature of the model is really just the fractional cover of the land surface temperature of the green veg plus the fractional cover of the NPV times its temperature, et cetera, et cetera, down the list to generate a model temperature for that pixel. Okay. And so this is what the histograms look like. So I went in and, and before I started this, I didn't know which things were going to be unique. Some things turned out to, cl to collapse. So this is what happens for the forest class. Its mean temperature was around 303 Kelvin. This is a combination of things like oak wood, oaks and eucalyptus. Turns out when you isolate individual trees in a citrus versus a, um, a, a um, avocado orchard, the trees are actually the same temperature. Citrus is hotter only because there's a higher fractional cover of soil. Right? Shrubs um, all look like Baccarus pilularis at 306. Irrigated grasses were warmer again at 308. Right? So they're our warmest veg class. Senest plant material, there were two distinct classes, dead grass at 320, and this yellow mustard, Brassica nigra, at 314, significantly colder. And then on the rough rock soil class, 321, I was a little surprised that statistically asphalt and concrete didn't fall out. Now you can actually see them in there in that this is our asphalt and this is our concrete, but they weren't separable enough to, to meet my statistics. However, high albedo roofs did. So the high albedo roofs are down at 320. And then commercial roofs, which I don't show here, were our hottest roofs at 330. And that's because they're made of the same material, basically, as asphalt. And so then we can take this model. And there's all kinds of ways you can mix and match the end members. So that's where I'm going to work when I publish this work. But here, this is just what I call the common model. So I took the most abundant form of dream vegetation across the landscape and the most common roof type and the most common road type, most common NPV pipe and created a model land surface temperature versus a measurement. And so what then you see, you can look at the temperature residual, and a couple things stand out. The riparian forests all come out as pretty much neutral, and that's, of course, they were, driven, they were driving the model. Urban trees and irrigated grasses are warm. They're about up to 10 degrees Celsius warmer than the riparian areas with that model. Urban streets were all cool. They were all about 5 degrees Celsius cooler than you would expect. And of course, that makes some sense. They're being shadowed, right? 
And then high albedo roofs were also cold. Of course, that, we use the commercial roof as the roof, so of course the high albedo roofs come up cold. So this is, for example, the Mission San, um, Santa Barbara right here, and there's their red tile roofs showing up as cold temperature anomalies. This one is another one I like. Um, this was looking at this one region here towards the west, and this is the senest mustard. And what I kind of thought was cool is not only is, is dead black mustard spectrally distinct from dead grass, um, it's actually thermally distinct. It's a lot colder than dead grass. And I think it's actually the vertical structure of the little dead stalks. Um, East-west roads turned out to be cold, right, in this model. North-south roads were warm, right? And I never would have guessed that road orientation made a difference, but after I thought about it, it makes sense. East-west roads, there's trees shadowing less way. North-south roads point right into the sun and no trees. Right? And then citrus and avocados were warm, right? which is what I was expecting. So that was a, a nice little study. So now we're going to dive into our last case, which is the vertical height information. This is from LIDAR, and this is all freely liberated from Mike Alonzo, who graduated from UCSB about a year and a half ago, and he's currently a professor at um, American University. Um, and so one might ask, what can you do with LIDAR? Well, there's a lot you can do with LIDAR. One of the things you can do with LIDAR is crown delineation. So one of the things Mike did as part of his dissertation is he worked up a watershed segmentation algorithm to automate it, do automated crown delineation. You might reason, ask the question why. Well, it turns out even if you're doing a pixel-based classification, if you turn around and you use a pixel majority filter, your accuracy significantly improves. So this is a case where he mapped 29 of the most common tree species in Santa Barbara. The majority pixel-based accuracy was 83%, the pixel-based 68%. And this is something everybody finds, right? And so Mike's key objective was to start with tree species mapping, right? He was interested in tree species mapping. He was also interested in urban forest structure as a way of bringing the structural component, ultimately feeding into ecosystem services. And so um, I'm skipping through lots of his material, but um, one of the things he did is he, he pulled up some list of a, a, a god-awful number of LIDAR structural metrics, and he ran a bunch of F statistics to figure out which of these were the most significant as a function of species. Um, so what he did is he ended up finding seven basic ones, and these are all the ones marked with the sort of gray bars, that within a class of LIDAR structural metric was the one that provided the greatest discrimination. And there are some pretty obscure ones. This one, for example, was... Um, Median height of returns and crown, that's not so bad, but some of the other ones like surface height, surf, divide, uh, surface height at 0.25 meter divided by the surface height at one meter is a pretty obscure one. But either way, these are the ones the statistics said were good. And then we did is use fusion, right? And so, and the, the, what we've been doing a lot is using canonical discriminant analysis. We found that to be the most accurate of all the classifiers. And he used forward feature selection to select the variables. And then, so what he's showing here is, first we're showing CF is CDA on everything. You know, all average wavelengths as well as the LIDAR, all those 20-something metrics. CS is all spectral bands in the seven select LIDAR bands. Just S is spectra alone, and then LI is LIDAR alone. And what you can very see, and this is species level, leaf type, leaf type all species, and leaf type less common species. And you can very clearly see that if you look at these, these three are all pretty similar. The little gray bar here is, is, um, is what you get from manual delineation versus watershed segmentation. So with just watershed segmentation and using just the seven variables from, um, CD, from LIDAR and all spectra, you're getting 83% at the species level, right? Just using the spectrometer alone, you get 79%. So the LIDAR isn't really buying you a lot of additional species discrimination. And this is we found repeatedly. Um, same with the leaf type, you do a little bit better. Um, and you do this, of course, for example, you might be interested in mapping everything in the urban environment, not just the 29 species you picked. Um, when you look at leaf type for all species, um, you do pretty well. For the really uncommon stuff, you don't do very well. And that's part of the statistics of CDA is it's, it's parameterizing its model on representation. And these poorly represented things just aren't mapping out well. Um, he also looked at, at specific plant species. Um, for example, this is um, Eucalyptus globulus. Um, this is uh, Pinus pinea, et cetera. And um, to see what did LiDAR fusion do, again, the same basic story that the imaging spectrometer was carrying the weight of the species classification. 
with a few exceptions. And these are these bars here, 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 and here, where you see the LiDAR made a big, um, important contribution. Turns out it has to do with crown size, right? The little crowns, Avarice wasn't working well, but in many cases these crowns are about three and a half to four meters across, which was the resolution of the sensor. The LiDAR had 40 points per meter squared. So we suspect with a fine spatial resolution imaging spectrometer, we could have mapped the species, those ones just as well. So the LiDAR is, is only working here mainly because it's all you got, right? The Avarice was too coarse. He also looked at urban tree structure, so he had a whole series of U4 plots. He went out and um, developed with a combination of his own work and a, an undergraduate army of slaves. And uh, he was able to compare his U4 plots to various structural measures from the LiDAR, such as crown diameter, crown surface area, crown length, log, log, leaf area, log, log plot. And you see they're all pretty well correlated. So in terms of forestry um, applications in an urban environment, the LiDAR was doing as well as any sort of plot-based measures. Now, he is very interested in leaf area index. And so here, for validation, you use Hemiphoto LAI. Um, and he did a couple of different kinds of measures. So, for example, one of them was using the last return LIDAR. The other one is using the first return LIDAR. And what he did is he used this LIDAR penetration metric, which is basically one minus fractional cover, right? So you're using the LIDAR to determine what's tree and not tree. And so the LIDAR penetration metric is one minus that. It's a Beer-Lambert style model, which is why you see the log in that final calculation. And then it has a couple of other key correct um, points. One, an assumption of a spherical leaf area density uh, distribution, as LAD. And then this EPOCOR, which is, I hate the acronym, but it's the expected pulse length through a crown given view angle and crown width to date our pulse length. These are not straight looking shots. These are coming in from the side. And so you have to correct them so as if they're looking straight up, right? And so that's what EPOCOR did. He did these sort of calculations for um, last return and first return, and the results were pretty good, right? As, as, you know, showing very good correlation with the measurements from the hemiphoto. And so with that in hand, then you can make a map, right? And so this middle map is showing the object scale leaf area index. So he's taking this equation and calculating out the LAI for individual trees, right? These are all trees delineated with watershed crown segmentation makes a map of the landscape. And then because we often are interested in raster-based modeling, he asked the question, what's the consequence of converting this over from an object-based analysis to a raster-based analysis? So he translated this over to 10 meters. So this is the raster-based LAI map equivalent. And then finally, this is the difference between the two. And what he found is, in general, you know, did pretty well. It's about an LAI error of anywhere between two to three, positive or negative, between the object-based version and the raster-based version of your leaf area index map. So it's an LAI map of an urban area. And so then, you know, what can you do this? Well, this is where, you know, you get to the point where you're finishing up your dissertation. You have another place to go. So you publish as much as you can, but you don't quite necessarily go to the final length of what you really wanted to do. So what we really wanted to do was actually do a fully distributed ecosystem service model. We got part of the way. Um, so what he has is species mapping, and this is just a really cool map showing that all the different tree species distributed around the Santa Barbara River area. You can see this is a riparian area. You can see the, the coast live oak and the Flissus platinus racemosa is sycamore in their own unique populations. You can see the individual tree trees. This is jacaranda, this is magnolia grandiflora, and this is eucalyptus felicifolia. So you see the individual plantings along the different streets. In addition, you get the structure from the LIDAR, and so then, Using a model, you can then ask, okay, what's the role of species? Well, one of the things that we model is air pollution removal, because species differ in their capacity to remove air pollutants. Look at water use. Species use different levels of water. Physiology, they respire and transpire and, and uh, evapotranspire at, di and res at different rates. And then finally, the classic term disservice, which is, you know, leaves, trees make flowers and leaves, and that's called a disservice because you have to clean it up, right? And then you can also look at the carbon footprint of this landscape and ask how much carbon is stored here, what's its uptake, what's its potential for shading and cooling. And so Mike focused really on the carbon side of the equation because that was the easiest. So he compared the LIDAR measured, measured metric tons versus field measured metric tons. Uh, wasn't too bad. 
Um, and I think this is the pooled model, and this is the separate model. And then he made a map of the carbon stocks in the Santa Barbara urban area, so you can see that shown here. And you can see how it varies as a function of land use. So you can see the areas where each individual tree is storing about the same amount of carbon, but with different land uses, you have different numbers of trees. Therefore, for example, as you might expect, a commercial area doesn't have a ton of carbon sequestered because it doesn't have a ton of trees. Right? And so those are the three stories. And so with that, um, just a quick summary. I, you know, I didn't start off with any interest in urban remote sensing when I started at UCSB. In fact, it was Martin Harold who wanted to do that that kind of coerced me in that direction. But it actually is turning out to be some of my most highly cited work, so I guess that's the way it works. Uh, it is an important thing. It's where we live, right? And it is, these, these places, although they take up a small part of the landscape, they actually have a very large impact on the landscape. Remote sensing has immense potential in these areas, but they're really difficult to work at because they're highly mixed and spectrally diverse. But there's also some really cool technologies coming out. For example, VSWIR, one of my personal favorites is Avers Next Gen, and if you ever get a chance to work with it, it is a dream. It's a, a push room sensor, 432 wavelengths. It can get sub-meter resolution, and you wouldn't believe what a tree looks like at half a meter spatial resolution. It is remarkable, right? Thermal infrared, high test is another sensor we've begun to work with. This is a 256 wavelength um, imaging spectrometer in the thermal. So one of my graduate students is doing species discrimination and canopy chemistry using high test data at Huntington Gardens. And then for us, LIDAR is very, very cool. There's not enough of it, but there are some data sets. And one of the particularly interesting ones is NEON ALP, which has an imaging spectrometer, which is Avris Next Gen. So it can produce one meter resolution. And it also has a full waveform LIDAR. And there are some, and they're all free data sets and all processed for you. So there's a lot of potential in these landscapes. And so with that, I'm more than happy to take some questions. And there. <laughs> and that's what I did on my sabbatical. Chase lizards. I did do other things, but. No, those butterflies are just on the shirt. <laughs> I did get bitten by a lot of sand flies. Um, so questions? Yes. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so the MP, MPV and the GV, yep. um, that's very interesting to me. Um, so how do you get the validation data to separate them? That's a very good question. There's different scales you can work with. Um, there's, um, of course, this kind of scale where your NPV patches are like senesced grass patches, you know, dead grass, in a, in a mixture of, um, of a, an urban landscape. So what you can do is, for example, create a large validation polygon. I did 100 meters on a side. And then do the avarice versus truth um, composition of that pixel. And that, what that gives you is a very nice, accurate way of estimating how well you did in that landscape. But there's another spatial scale that's harder to work with, which is, let's say, for example, you're doing, let's say, a patch of dead grass, which actually could be a mixture of dead grass and soil, right? Because the assumption we're making in the other resolution is that it's all dead grass, but actually it could be dead soil, uh, um, soil as well. So for that, we're doing a lot of work with CCD cameras, um, although that one doesn't work so easily because CCD cameras can't really tell the two apart. Um, so another thing we're doing, and this is work that's being performed by Phil Dennison as part of a subcontract to JPL to produce a uh, standardized MESMA product, is we're doing a lot of simulations. And so what Phil has taken is a whole series of data sets that people have collected, including some of my own, some by Craig Doherty and others, where we know the actual fractional cover of NPV versus soil, NGV, and we have the associated spectra. And he's using those as, as inputs into a, a full radiative transfer model to simulate what the spectra should be and then do an inverse calculation running MESMA to see what MESMA does. So we're generating basically synthetic mixtures using real data and then with known fractional covers and then back having see how MESMA performs. And, and the good news is we found it produces very high correlations. So it's doing a really nice job and well, and it has nice one-to-one -one lines. So it's doing quite well at that scale the bad news is there is a fair amount of scatter, right? And so it does completely miss on occasion and calls an NPV a soil, right, for some reason. But, but that's kind of how we have been doing that. So it's, 
it's sort of sub-pixel scale modeling versus larger scale reference polygons. Okay, unless somebody else. <laughs> Yes. So there's other aspects I can see that the topography can have a big impact on the temperature and the radiation. And so these these cases, the topography is identical. So the, the um, yellow mustard is essentially the same landscape as the grass. But we have other areas in the landscape where we have slopes that are facing away from the sun, where they are cool anomalies. So that's a case where it really is a topographic effect. So one would want to take into account. So I, that if you look very carefully, there's actually a north-facing slope that is also an anomalous cool zone, and that's topographic, not species. So both come in, and that's a good question too. Yeah, okay. Hi, I think this was a really interesting presentation. I was curious about the Well, so it may be possible to port libraries, right? So this is something we're very interested in. So one could, for example, take the same spectral library you've developed for one urban area, spatial, spectrally degrade it to a Landsat, which is readily available, and then model that other landscape. And what we've found when applying these same approaches to Landsat with Landsat, but using a, a, a more diverse spectral library, and this is work by Becky Powell, it does really well, right? And so. So you can do this at Landsat scales. And in fact, what Becky found, which was really absolutely cool, is um, when she was doing her work in, the, sta in the, city, uh, the state of Rondonia in Brazil, is she found that the most interesting thing she found, beyond you know, the fractional cover was cool, was the number of end members you needed to model a pixel was a really good measure of land use. So if you had really complex landscapes, urban, requiring four end members, that was a beautiful map of the urban extent. And she actually did a log-log population versus urban extent model, perfect line, right on following Walter Tobler. If you looked at modified, but not so heavily modified landscapes like pastures, that took three end members. The natural landscapes all took two. So you could do this really cool stuff with Landsat, right? None of this does, does requires an imaging spectrometer. We get better results with an imaging spectrometer, but we can do amazing things with Landsat as well. Right. You do need libraries. So Becky actually brought back a bunch of urban roof materials from Brazil, and we measured them in Santa Barbara in the lab. So we did need some data. And I've measured a lot of Brazilian soils. There was a question. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on temporal variability of these spectral signatures. I know you've done a lot of work to compile these libraries, and, but are they fixed for a particular point in time? Obviously, phenology has some effect, but I'm thinking even finer scale variability on diurnal scales as we um, Okay, so the daily um, variability is probably not that significant, but the seasonal variability is quite significant. So what we've been doing, um, this is work by Kenneth Dudley, um, Keely Roth, my current student Susan Muirdink. Um, you get, you can, one of the things you can do is you can turn the, co the, the coin on its head and ask the question, if we brought in the entire seasonality, right, and how spectra vary seasonally, could we produce a better map, right? What we've found actually is no, right? So when we throw at, um, you know, four different dates of imagery, of imagery into the problem of species mapping, we find that any one individual date is just as accurate, for example, as using all the dates. So the, adding the extra dates are not improving our ability to map, even if we do know the spectra are actually changing seasonally, right? But what we've found by doing that approach is if we use the entire season to build the library, we can build a, spectral, a temporally robust library that no matter where you, you know, when you collected the data, whether it's a spring image or a fall image, it will produce the same equal accuracy. And where this is really important is because phenology is not just over time, it's over space. As you go up on the elevational gradient, you go from 
warmer temperatures to cooler temperatures, and plants naturally shift to an earlier part in their phenological cycle. If you don't account for that in your classification, you will misclassify the higher elevation versions of the same plant. Right? But by doing this, by building a, a, multi, a multi-temporal library, we've built a pretty robust way of handling species regardless of how they operate in time. But you do need to bring in the time. Right? And, and we're interested in that because we're very interested in going global. So if we ever get an imaging spectrometer in space that's any good, we would want to do this globally, but we need to build libraries that are actually robust from seasonal variation. Right. It was a very good question. Yes? Thanks, Dar. Uh, so for your urban surface temperatures work, have you been able to explore the role that spatial dependence plays? For example... Do you think about like the Arizona State stuff going on in Phoenix, or...? Well, with the... Um, just in the remote sensing, like a really small... Maybe I'm not familiar with that work, but the, uh, a small pixel of asphalt might have a different surface, surrounded by lots of greenery, might have a different surface temperature. We've been looking at that, and that's, that's, that's actually a lot of what Erin Weatherly is yeah. trying to do. So she's already done some really nice work showing that she can separate turf grass from tree with high fractional cover accuracy. She's also trying to link this into thermal models. Um, so far, I wouldn't say it's been 100% success. She has some really nice data because we also have a FLIR, so she's been a lot of doing a lot of these measurements of transects, um, from one you know, edge to another. Um, that's a direction we're going in, and we're working with, um, we're partly funded out of this really of sort of obscure program called Belspo out of Belgium, and that's a big chunk of what we're doing there as well. And so I, I want to go down that direction, and, and we're beginning to build the data to do that, but we haven't gone all the way. And part of it is a spatial resolution problem, that as long as we're living in a data set where our thermal data is 15 meters, and our average is at best seven and a half meters, we don't really have good spatial resolution to actually answer that question, except in the broadest sense. And we do see some of that. I have, um, I have seen that spa- there have been spatial um, t- um, gradients in temperature in the Santa Barbara data set that has to do with, for example, proximity to coast versus interior. But I haven't really explored that that much because I haven't gotten a chance to write that up. I just did it at ESA. So. Yeah, it seems like it- it has some real potential, and so, and Aaron's doing this over the entire Los Angeles basin. Um, but we're dealing, she's dealing with 18 meter data. And if we could just live in a world with one meter average and two meter thermal, boy, would be, we could answer that question, but there is no such data like that. Yeah, we wrote a proposal to NASA to get that data or a Phoenix, but we went down in flames. So, happens. <laughs> uh, more questions? So for those of you that are interested in, in asking Dr. Roberts more about remote sensing, he'll be available for a very brief window at our uh, post gathering happy hour. Um, and otherwise, thank you very much for a great talk. Well, thanks for having.